post-conversion identity of Markar mentioned in an earlier document. And the earlier document was only from three months earlier. I actually wrote Baki about this one. I was like, is it possible for someone to convert and become a Janissary and get this title and just con you know, transform in a period of three months? It's pretty remarkable. Um, <clears throat> and so thinking about that three months, you know, it really would not have left much time really for um, remarriage to another man. I mean, she still has to wait the three month waiting period before she remarried. And so there's another clue, because Abdullah, of course, is a convert name, a, son, a slave of God. And so many Haram historians have noted in the registers, you know, adopting the Abdullah as a post conversion um, patronym was very common for converts in the early Ottoman period. And so if Suleiman were indeed Markar, he was able to perform this amazing feat uh, by elevating himself to the status of Janissary to a position that was actually for sale and could be purchased. And here I put note. <laughs> we talked about this in your book. So, Tamar herself did not convert. She's described as a Christian all along, and a subsequent record shows her continue her continuing to prosper in real estate um, long after her divorce. So, um, <clears throat> I think you know it's it's just worth thinking about the kind of new rights that someone like Suleiman could attain, seeing that he's bearing this really important title and the kind of power that's concentrating among Janissaries at this time, 18th century. Okay, so this is uh, my first case. The second case I actually translated for you. Um, and this is a case of conversion as divorce. I'm very fascinated by this kind of move towards conversion, especially when it's so obvious as a, you know, what kind of tactical <clears throat> reason somebody would choose this. At times, a decision to convert is laid bare as a legal tactic, especially in the case of um, Christian women's conversion to Islam, since the process itself transitioned her from one of the lowest possible statuses, only that above children and slaves in the Ottoman system, into a higher um, <clears throat> status than even a non-Muslim man when she transforms into a Muslim woman. And so with that context in mind, I share this case, again from September 19, 1735, she, this woman, also named Kamar, apparently a popular name, uh, came to court to register her conversion to Islam. Now, um, <clears throat> again, about, about the names, I mean, I think that clearly Armenians living in an Islamicate environment, you can see some of the mo one of the most popular names for men is Mirza, actually, a Persian name for Armenian men. So Kamar apparently is popular for women. Um, here we have, um, you know, again, in this case, we can learn also from her name. Her name is Kamar, daughter of Matuk, and Matuk means somebody who's been manumitted as a slave. So there, there are clues in the name itself about this woman's history. Um, her Armenian husband, what we learn, is her Armenian husband, Sarkis son of Isa, was actually absent from court that day, and his whereabouts were unknown. She had brought two Muslim wit witnesses to testify to her conversion. The document uses the stock phrase, to introduce Kamar as a convert honored in the Islamic faith. How are we to understand her conversion in, into Islam in light of additional information about her absent husband? You know, had, had the document not mentioned the absent husband, maybe it would not have raised any questions. There are important social factors that may have prompted the conversion of a non-Muslim woman as a legal, legal tactic. Christich notes that the conversion actually offered the non-Muslim woman the ability to, quote, temporarily overturn the equations of power within their communities and escape the control of domineering fathers and husbands through converting or just opting for cohabitation with a Muslim, unquote. And Mark Baer uh, explains that Jewish women's conversion to Islam in the 17th century, Istanbul, was an attempt to overcome the limit rabbinic law placed on women's access to divorce. One may ask then, what did Armenian canon law have to say, really, about divorce that may have prompted this woman's conversion to Islam. So an important aspect of Kummer's case, one that reveals that her conversion may have been a legal strategy rather than a sincere conversion, is the estrangement from her husband. Now this appears to be a common trend. M Armenian husbands were a lot, they were absent sometimes for long periods of time on these trading missions, especially Jolfin husbands. They, were, they had a, a, a very intricate system of letter writing to communicate with their wives, but also ways of sending money. And Sebo Aslanian has done all that groundwork for me. Um, but they would travel as far away as India and Venice on business. And according to Hori Barberian, Armenian legal codes established um, by Jolfin Armenians that settled in Astrakhan, which is a place just north of the Caspian Sea 
on the Volga River, it dealt with the probability that women would experience prolonged periods of neglect by their husbands. Um, so Armenian codes actually dealt with this. And in order to keep those women from straying, the codes prescribed a series of draconian punishments, including the branding of women or the cutting off of their noses if they cheated on their husbands while they were gone. So the reprieve an up unhappy wife could obtain through conversion as a tactic to escape an undesirable marriage or undesirable, my undesirable marriage conditions are clear once the limitations of Armenian canon law are made clear. With its strict criteria of divorce and annulment, it was nearly impossible to obtain a divorce under the Armenian church's jurisdiction. Here I think I have. <clears throat> Here's an Armenian law code. It's, it's older, but believe me, it was used throughout the Ottoman period. Uh, Mikhtar Ghosh composed this law code specifically for Armenians living in Muslim lands. This, is, this was supposed to be your go-to text if you were an Armenian living in, under um, Muslim rule. And he describes, um, so you can talk about, for example, abandonment and marriage. And he describes in a, a scenario akin to Kumar's when he writes, that if a man has gone and traveled or is away or does not return to his home, the wife is to remain faithful. He continues, but if a false report comes of his death or the loss of others, let her not marry another husband until she verifies it. So even receiving a report of your husband's death is not enough, even if the absence continues for many years. And if the account of death is reliable for seven years, now if the account is reliable, she's not supposed to marry for seven years after that reliable account. Yeah, um, you know, conversion to Islam, it might be your path to a divorce. So the law code does not provide any more details concerning how long a woman would be required to wait for an absent husband to return. The omission and difficulty of proof suggests that without evidence, it would be nearly impossible for an Armenian woman to be released from the bonds of marriage. The only conditions by which a woman could legally obtain a divorce in the Armenian canon, uh, this law code in particular, are if a husband commits sodomy or bestiality, or, and this is interesting, if he pollutes himself with a foreigner. According to the code, the husband's infidelity is not grounds for divorce, yet a husband can obtain a divorce if he has an adulterous wife. Furthermore, in contradistinction to Islamic law, impotency is not grounds for divorce. Impotency is grounds for divorce in, in the Sharia courts in practice, but not for Armenian code. Um, and so, if she had sought even for an annulment um, or divorce under Armenian canon law, um, she would have very limited rights. Okay, and so um, I would say in Islamic law, once Kamar converted, it was illegal for her to remain married to her husband. It worked as an automatic annulment. So it was a de facto divorce because Sharia forbids a Muslim woman to be married to a non-Muslim man. And Judith Tucker argues that, quote, when a woman converted to Islam and her husband remained a dhimmi, the Qadi was forced to annul the marriage, unquote. An added bonus is that if there were any offspring from that marriage, she would obtain permanent custody of the children. So typically, Sharia guidelines would split child custody between parents, only granting the mother custody during early childhood, but here things are different. So she must have known about the possibility prior to appearing to court, and I'm really interested in how it appears women were sharing this knowledge with each other. They, they came to court prepared, and you'll see more of that in some more cases I'll show you, or two more cases I'll show you. Kummer's understanding of the law is further supported by her having obtained a fatwa. And so this is how this is how I understand that women knew how things worked and they came equipped and prepared to defend themselves at court. So a fatwa is not a bind, binding legal ruling, but this fatwa, it came from the city mufti of Aleppo to support her petition for divorce. Now, in, in Kamar's case, we weren't provided the contents of the fatwa, but I found a very similar case by a woman named Fatima that I'm sharing with you now that gives us an idea of what some of these fatwas could look like. A woman could bring it to court to use it to further support her case. So in a, in a similar case, this is what the judge offered, or excuse me, the mufti offered. A question, if his wife converts to Islam and he, the husband, is absent, <clears throat> and his whereabouts are unknown, and he does not receive the invitation to convert to Islam, should, and then the document was damaged, that happens sometimes, separate, um, should the judge separate them 
as a solution? And the answer is yes, the judge shall appoint someone to act legally on behalf of the absent husband and order separation because he, the husband, is absent and his whereabouts are unknown. Um, we don't have really extensive fatwa collections from Aleppo, so sometimes I like to sort of tease these out because um, some of these judges, or excuse me, some of these muftis, their fatwa collections were never published or, or compiled properly. But this is a fatwa that could be very similar to the kind of fatwa that uh, our, our Kamark brought to court to support herself. And although they're not binding, the court did take them into account and would use them as further evidence to support a case. It's rare to find a fatwa that's not upheld or used to support a case by a judge. Okay, so you got the, 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 the idea here. So she understood the legal challenges that, or legal channels that could benefit her, and she apparently investigated the law enough to know her rights were limited in, Hanif in the Hanafi court, because if she would have argued, I want a divorce in Islamic law because my husband's absent, she would not have gotten that, not in the Hanafi court maybe in a Shafi court. Okay, so I don't mean to suggest that Dimmi women had a wide range of powers at court. I mean, Mark Baer offers a, a corrective to earlier scholarship that assumed that moments of agency, as I've described with Kalmar, translated into women's ability to exercise control over their lives. Few women could access the law in this way, and if they did, Baer argues that they were simply trading in one form of patriarchy for another. But in this process of legal bargaining, Convert women navigated the courts and worked to maximize the benefits where they could. And these strategies are not unique to Armenian women in Aleppo Sharia courts, as gender historians of the Ottoman Empire have documented a wide array of women's legal strategies at court as they attempted, albeit temporarily, to destabilize gender and social hierarchies. So we're now on case three, and um, I have these are just one, two more cases, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. But I wanted to share like a range of cases, and this is one of the more interesting developments in the Sharia courts of Aleppo. Here, an Armenian woman, Ma uh, Malaya Khan, daughter of Abdul Ahed, again, non-Armenian names, she appeared in court on October 24th, 14, or excuse me, 6, 1742, and the record lists that the woman, a resident of the neighborhood of Shukrapastel in Aleppo, was married to Muhammad, um, son of Abdullah, a convert to Islam. They're listed as having four small children. And then the document tells us these children, quote, followed their father in converting to Islam. And their names are all Muslim, definitely Muslim. Ahmed, Mustafa, Yasin, and Fatima. The record tells us that Malai Khan remains, quote, remains with her infidelity and her erroneous ways. And um, when she dies, she wants to be buried in the Christian cemeteries. And Christians were buried according to denomination. So if you're an Armenian, you don't get to be buried in the Greek Orthodox cemetery. You're, mar you're buried in the Armenian cemetery. So it's sort of understood where she would be buried. These burial requests are probably the most prominent among the records of conversion in Aleppo and possibly unique to the courts that I've studied. Similar burial requests were um, registered by Rum Orthodox women and also <coughs> Arab Assyrian women. And they're often recorded when a woman's husband converts However, in some cases, children or other members of the household appear to have been motivated to come to court and assert their Christian identity. Despite being married to Muslim converts, these women did not want to adopt the religious identities of their husbands and instead registered their Christian identities at court. And although the court shows a clear bias against them as members of a minority group, what it, what it deems an inferior religion when it describes her request to be buried in the Armenian cemetery it, um, there's another record, for example, that calls it according to despicable customs, um, or that she, quote, insisted on her infidelity. So the, the, there's kind of a bias in the record for sure, but um, I want to sort of look at what she's doing. I think it's quite um, interesting to see her agency and read through this rhetoric. So the harsh formulated condemnations, I mean, they're disturbing, but it's also coupled with the court's willingness to accommodate her. And these are important aspects, I think, um, of Islamic law that really afforded women limited rights over their religious identity as evidenced in Ottoman fatwas. Um, jurists def defended the rights of non-Muslim women not to be forcibly converted by their Muslim husbands and to convert if they wanted to, despite the husband's wishes. So clearly, the Ottoman juridical tr tradition took clear, uh, seriously the Quranic command, um, there is no compulsion in religion. 
and this is evidenced in an opinion issued by the Ottoman spiritual authority, Sheikh al-Islam Yahya Effendi, um, Minarkaz, Minkarazadeh, Minkarazadeh, sorry. I, for some reason I got a glare, I really apologize, but I don't know why I'm not seeing all that well today. Um, the question, if the non-Muslim Zayed converts, tell his Christian wife Hind to come to Islam and forces her to convert, is it, is it a valid conversion? And the answer, very simple, it is not. <laughs> um, and so the, you know, we have Shaykh Islams who are saying a husband cannot forcibly convert a wife. The fact that clearly gives women the right to make their own choice with regard to their individual religious identity. So, however, in the end, the prospects for a male convert to Islam were much higher than they were for women as it entailed financial incentives combined with political and social advantages. Available literature on conversion lists a number of incentives, including the elimination of jizya tax, ascending to political and military office, and social capital as members of the majority versus the minority underclass. So this could explain also why it wasn't necessarily advantageous for women to convert as much as it was for men. Now children are <clears throat> left out of the matter with no choice. Um, they're automatically the identity of the father will pass on to the children. And we can't know, for example, if these are the names that those children are even called at home. Um, Bernard Heiberger, for example, has illuminated um, the life of Muslim converts in the 17th century according to missionary reports. And we learn, for example, that some Armenian converts continue to practice sacred rituals in the home. We could imagine maybe even dual names. And this has come up in other literature where, where um, even contemporary um, crypto Armenians or um, Armenian conversos in Turkey have maybe dual names in the household. So this peculiar process by which um, Armenian women had a choice not to convert presents a contrasting image to those kind of records of forcible conversion that we have, where women had some agency in determining their own religious identity, but were still rendered the weakest and most vulnerable free subjects in the Ottoman social hierarchy. Um, now I do have another case that shows where a child might react. And um, I just wanted to throw this out here before I move to my last case. And here um, we have um, a, a woman named Beirouz. And here is what the case reads. In front, present before the judge is the oldest daughter, of uh, uh, plaintiff Beirouz, daughter of Bagzar, the Christian from the Armenian community. She's a resident of the known Sahat Biza quarter in Aleppo with her brother, Khalil, son of Aslan, resident of inside Babu Meirouz quarter in Aleppo. It tells us where people are living. She submitted that she was 14 years old and that three months earlier her mother, Miriam, converted to Islam and was honored by the religion of Islam. And while she, Beirouz, did not, she remains Christian, and if she dies Christian, bury her in the Christian cemeteries. So here we have, I mean, again, 14 is pubescent. It's, a, it's, a, it's an adult status, but it's the daughter of a convert who comes to court to say, I want to be buried in the Christian rites. And, and so it's not only wives. So here's the last one. It's a final case just to kind of show us something a little different before we talk and break up. Um, this is a, a, a remarriage. And on, in 1765, this woman, an Armenian woman, who's given an unusually long name, Khanum, daughter of Melkon, the sword maker, son of Khachatur, um, <laughs> so we need to learn the, pr the profession of her father. She appeared in court um, with her own dilemma, and it's really <coughs> She had been married to a Muslim named Mustafa, son of Abdullah. The patronym, as we know now, indicates that her husband was probably a, 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 a convert. And um, <clears throat> we learn that he had died 10 months earlier and that she was still a Christian and wished to remarry. The problem was that she sought to marry a Christian Armenian man by the name of Juanes, and it wasn't clear at I guess it wasn't clear to her, or she wanted to make sure that this was legal. So she came to court uh, wondering, really, whether it was legal to marry a, an Armenian Christian after having been married to a Muslim. Um, it may seem clear-cut, but she came equipped with a fatwa, and her, this is what her fatwa contents read. Um, it's question, there is a dimmy woman whose Muslim husband died, and her mandatory waiting period is passed. Can she marry a dimmy like her or not? And the answer, yes, she can. Very brief answers because these, these um, muftis are very busy. 
answering people's mm -hmm. questions, so the answer is very mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um Khanam used the fat. Her use of the fatwa showed that she possessed some, you know, again, some knowledge about how things worked, and that she, if she attain, obtained a fatwa before her court appearance, um, you know, the judge would maybe side with her. Since the fatwa was non-binding, in a hypothetical scenario, it was ultimately settled only with a notarized uh, court document or a hujjah. So it may have been necessar unnecessary to bring the fatwa, since she had not converted to Islam herself, um, but um, if she had converted, of course, marrying a Christian would have been impossible. But it appears that she had no children, and that made also her marriage easier. Sorry. The record describes um, two Muslim witnesses who verified that her husband, Mustafa, had indeed died 10 months earlier. Following the testimonies, Hanum was wedded to Wani's son of Arakil with a modest dowry of 10 piastres. And Hanum's case is really revealing, once again, we see how the court afforded avenues for Armenian women to articulate their identities as Christian, even after a period of marriage with a Muslim. Now with regard to the husband, we learn that even when Armenian women married Christians, it's not, it's not always a stable situation. Um, her deceased husband had a convert name. So it's possible that he too may have been Armenian and converted to Islam. I mean, we, we really don't get that information, but what we learn is you may be married to a Christian one minute and that Christian may become a Muslim. And so it changes the dynamic in the family. And this really also works against, um, you know, just thinking about marriage and remarriage, I think is important because we're often thinking about marriage in Victorian terms, eternal bonds, <laughs> rings of eternity. And people got married multiple times, as we can see from some of these cases. Um, so I'm gonna conclude. I wanna conclude with an anecdote. As you know, I like stories. So I want to tell you just a small anecdote, which is when I was in Turkey last spring doing research, I met up with another Ottoman historian, and he asked me what I was working on, and I said I was working on Armenians in the 17th and 18th century Aleppo, and this is, I mean, this is a well-known Ottoman historian. He told me I didn't know Armenians were in Aleppo in the 17th and 18th century, and it's it's because of this kind of void that we have. We really don't know much about um, this community. And I mention it not to shame him, you know, <laughs> but I mention it just to say that, um, you know, I, maybe even some Armenians would have a similar reaction. I mean, we tend to think about Armenians in Syria coming during World War One, not, in, you know, maybe coming in the 16th or 17th century. I mean, Aleppo, for example, is going to receive 100,000 Armenian refugees during uh, World War One, building up into uh, the 1920s. Aleppo was a major gathering site for Armenian deportees during the war. Later, refugee camps were established, and those camps will become the predominant Armenian quarters that we're familiar with today in Aleppo. But the Christian suburb that I'm studying now was developed much earlier, and it's kind of really strange and awkward to be studying at a time when Aleppo is being actively destroyed. Um, to move back to this subject, the legal typologies that I offered in this presentation are telling of the ways that Armenian women navigated conversion within their families in, the 18th, in these 18th century court appearances. Women's legal options were quite limited with regard to personal status matters. Therefore, the legal bargaining that they did at court sometimes did little to improve their overall status. At most, they were able to briefly overturn the power dynamics in their relationships with Armenian men in the case of the tactical choice to convert to Islam. When Armenian women remarried, uh, or excuse me, when remained Christian despite their husband's conversion, their choices were limited to their religious identity and final internment. Not very promising. But women could find themselves married to a Christian at one moment and a Muslim at the next, really leaving them legally and socially vulnerable. So children were certainly the most vulnerable since they lacked choices in the matter and would be converted to the religion of their Muslim <coughs> father. Most Armenians were bound to the church that formed the basis of their community in the Ottoman Empire, but there were others who transitioned for a variety of practical, social, and economic reasons. Religious conviction, maybe. You know, social mobility, economic opportunity, and maybe to escape an unhappy marriage arrangement. Converts offer a view into the ways in which the empire accommodated and transitioned converts, sometimes even using them in service of the state, in diplomacy, and in the military. Importantly, recent trends in Ottoman Armenian studies have eroded the notion that there were clear-cut boundaries between communities in the early modern Mediterranean world. The implication of this trend is that conversion has much wider social and political ramifications than just 
um, internal communal dynamics, making it a worthwhile stu uh, subject of study. So that's it for now, and I'd be happy to take the questions. someone as Armenian uh -huh. is the language they speak or is there an ethnic component or other way that they would identify as Armenian? So I'm what I'm fortunate when the court record will just tell me somebody is Armen, and then I know they're from the Armenian Ta'ifa or community. Okay. And then there's this other methodological yeah. problem I have which is the court only really wants to do that in the late 17th century. And that has left me in a pickle because I had to develop a sort of a methodology, which, I mean, again, this isn't a finished product, so I'm, I'm interested in hearing what you think. Um, so I looked at ethnic names, and that's not, I'm not getting everybody because the ethnic names are not always Armenian. Uh, but what you might notice is that sometimes the, the name of the individual is maybe Arabic, but the father's name is ethnic Armenian. Okay. Something's going on with, a, I would, maybe I would call it acculturation or yeah. some kind of a cultural confluence that's happening where Armenians are adopting Turkish, Persian, and Arabic names. And, but the patronyms are sometimes still Armenian, and okay. so I'm, I'm designating a nominal Armenian sure. identity to somebody who may not have I even identified as Armenian as we know it today, just so that I can study the subject. Yeah. Um, that is not like, I, I mean, I realize that that's something we could talk about. Maybe, it's, maybe there's a better way to do it, but that's what I've devised. Otherwise, the only thing I can do is look at Armenians at the end of the 17th century forward. One second. I can't do the earlier period. Now, um, the Tapu records are very clear. This is how many Armenians there are in this neighborhood. And that kind of clarity is nice to have. Yes. Uh, I'm fascinated by this. There's some uh, research on that in Yeah. Where I, I, I have a data set about 100 years of marriages that I've then actually published that for some reason. The uh, majority of the, of the neighborhood were Armenians. And what I found a pattern that during the periods of, of more turmoil, there were more intermarriages, periods mm -hmm. outside of the state. And then when things kind of got uh, quieter, then they tend to be very uh, more endogenous marriages, very within. Um, and uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, which you could go into. But I was wondering if your data set was large enough that you could, able, you could, were there patterns? Could you tell that when there were more marriages, were there some kind of exogenous reasons for those marriages? Were there turmoil? Mm -hmm. uh, what was the data set not large enough to be able to link it to historical transformations locally? So I have recorded all of the marriages um, that I have in the Sharia court. And then, of course, the church didn't, as far as I know, and I've, I've been in there, they didn't preserve any of that material. Maybe they didn't think it was important. Or maybe, maybe I just wasn't given access. I mean, that's always a kind of a question I have. But uh, So I haven't crunched the numbers on that. I, I mean, it's, it's part of the project, definitely, is taking all these marriage records and kind of looking for patterns. But what we're not getting is the complete picture of all the endogamous marriages because although some endogamous marriages were recorded in the Sharia court, surprisingly, Armenian Armenian marriages are sometimes recorded in the Sharia court. Um, not all of them were. Um, you know, a lot of them were, were recorded at the Prelacy, and the Prelacy had no documents. They didn't preserve documents. So I was kind of I was disappointed. I was really hoping for that, or even baptismal records or something, and um, they weren't there. Um, at least they weren't. I could say they weren't shared. The archivist did have a healthy suspicion of me. And <laughs> I talked to Hagnar about that. He was very suspicious of me. I have a question in regards to case number two. You talked about that um, the Armenian men would. They were oftentimes like merchants and travel around the world. And mm -hmm. if um, someone's husband died, they couldn't get remarried. What would they do as a source of income? What would these women do during that waiting period? So that's a good question. The best clue we have is, um, so Sebu Aslani, who teaches at UCLA, I've said his name a few times, but he's very meticulous and he's come across some amazing caches of documents of Armenian merchants. And what we know about these Jolfin merchants and many of these merchants that settle in um, Aleppo are Jolfin. Um, they had a very complex um, 
system of exchange. They were, they were doing a lot of letter writing, so they were writing things down and they were sending money. Um, and they would also have people looking out for their families when they were gone. And so um, basically they were taking care of each other's families when they were off on business. So it is very complicated. If you read his book, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. And, and I think he's kind of onto something with regard to how Armenians were sort of transitioning towards this much more, I think he, at the end of the book he's kind of pointing towards modernity, that there's kind of modernity to this very complex system of exchange. Your talk, I think this is uh, not just Armenians in Aleppo <laughs> in the early modern period.